Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. A lot of important and also interesting stories. We have new developments with regards to Russia and Ukraine and also our administration's response. We have some very, very revealing and interesting comments, um, uh, a very prominent uh, official calling for diplomacy, something that you rarely hear on cable news. So mm -hmm. we're going to break all of that down. Also some new developments in terms of the stock market and new uh, uh, regulations from the Biden administration with regard to chips being exported to China that could be quite significant. This is a story I've been following for a while, our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Now you have Senator Menendez, who is the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, saying, hey, you know what? It's time to stop selling arms it's extraordinary. to the Saudis. Right. Huge development. His rationale is uh, interesting and revealing in and of itself. But we'll get to that. And we also have an important update for you on a story we covered a while back, animal rights activists who had been uh, arrested and charged for rescuing two piglets, which were on the verge of death. They sent in like half a dozen FBI That's agents horrible. across state lines, all with regard to these two little piglets expending these incredible federal government resources. Why? Because they're embarrassing the, uh, you know, big ag, agricultural, uh, industrial farming industry. So we'll break that all down for you as well. We've got two Chipotle workers on who are organizing uh, Chipotles across the country. So excited about that one. Let's start with Ukraine. Of course, the most important after missiles rain down, not only on Kyiv, but really across the entire country, hitting critical energy infrastructure, stopping Ukraine actually from exporting energy for one of the first times in the war and causing long-standing blackouts everywhere. There has been increased calls from Ukraine and President Zelensky in order to get allies to send them advanced air defense systems. I'll go ahead and put this up there on the screen from the Washington Post, which is that the attacks against the cities and the key infrastructure actually has galvanized a long-standing debate amongst allied countries on what exact, what exact sophisticated air defense systems and critically long-range weapon systems that they should provide provide to Ukraine. So going a little bit into this, it's complicated because the United States actually does and has provided long or surface to air missile defense systems known as, and I don't want to screw this up for the geeks out there, <laughs> NASAMS, the National Advanced Surface to Air Missile System. They're always very creative with the, what they say. Now, we have actually been providing Ukraine with those systems since July. However, we provided them two anti-aircraft systems, of which the Ukrainians say that they have actually used quite well during that attack, Crystal. Yeah. There's no way to know. The Ukrainians claim that they shot down like half of the missile cruise missiles that were fired on Ukraine. I don't know. I Russians mean, there's some, say they hit all their targets. Right. Russians say course. they hit all their targets. Yeah. Who knows uh, what's true <laughs> and what's not. In fact, there was some video showing that there were some backfire on the surface air missile system. The pr problem is, is that for the United States to provide Ukraine with all of the systems that were ask they are going to be asking for, here's the issue. We don't have them. Yeah. It will take, quote, several years to procure and to deliver, as in we literally do not have any of the leftovers. What we do have are some Soviet-era defense systems that officials have said are already being familiar to the Ukrainian troops. Now, those have been provided by Slovakia and a few other of the allies. Germany also announced yesterday, it will be providing some of air defense systems as well. They're known as IRST air defense systems and said that they would have arrived, quote, in the next few days. However, this is not the fulsome nature of what the Ukrainians want because right. they are actually combining what has just happened with air defense systems on top of, hey, by the way, we also need those long range missile systems that you refuse to sell us because they're saying they need to have a war of defense to be able to strike on the missiles that are targeting yes. them. Well, that brings us into a very different strategic ter uh, territory because we did not provide them those weapon systems specifically because we were afraid that it would spark a bigger conflict with Russia, according to Biden. However, and let's put the next one up there on the screen, Ukraine is very, very savvily, I will say on their part, uh, approaching and it's quote, weapons wish list as <laughs> the winter approaches. So <clears throat> what we've seen here is that on top of their new air defense systems, really what they want is to be able to deter 
critical Ukrainian infrastructure strikes, the likes of which that we just saw yesterday. The issue is that there is a major conflict in Washington to try and separate out any defensive system from an offensive system. Right. And you can you can completely make sense, which is that in U.S. military doctrine, for example, part of the reason we were so against a no-fly zone is because there's no such thing as just declaring a no-fly zone. Like, if you declare one, that means you have to be able to take out any of the systems which are gonna shoot down your planes. So now you're in a war of offense even though you're technically in a war of defense. And this is gonna be the critical debate I think in the next couple of days given the fervor uh, of how people are reacting after the Ukrainian attack. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, interesting context here. First of all, you know, in the early days of this war, Zelensky, and you all will probably recall this, was very upfront about what his demands were, what he wanted, was making public, very public appeals. Those public appeals were sort of dialed back over time because he recognized that this was not really the most effective way to operate. The demands did not go away, but instead of being publicly uh, issued, instead it was, you know, talking mm-hmm. to the administration directly and continuing to press for more and more uh, weapons, and including these um, missile defense systems and also uh, in the longer range missiles that they still are very much pressing for. So what was interesting here is the minute effectively, that you had these Russian strikes across the country, you had a concerted public effort from the Ukrainians to ask specifically for anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems to Ukraine. So you had the defense minister tweeting the best response to Russian missile terror is the supply of anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems to Ukraine. This will protect our cities and our people. This will protect the future of Europe. You had the foreign minister tweeting after Russian attacks that we urgently need more modern air defense and missile defense systems to save innocent lives. You had a presidential advisor tweeting, instead of talking, we need air defense, MLRS, longer range projectiles. And Estonia's intelligence chief, and we've been covering Estonia, they're very hawkish in terms of their approach to this conflict. They also are calling for uh, these types of longer range weapons to Ukraine. And that's the piece that, you know, the Biden administration is concerned would be very escalatory. As Sagar, you were indicating, Mm. the concern over the uh, anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems is less about that escalatory factor right. and more about just not having those systems right. available. And also what we may need should we ever get into a conflict. Right. Yeah. So um, the idea was uh, that, you know, we would provide them certain things that we have been providing and we would sort of fund their ability to procure on their own these types of systems. Now, of course, that will, as you indicate, take quite a while for those to be developed. And then there's the question of training and whether they'll be ready to go to um, effectively utilize those system. So, you know, if you're Russia, just think about this because I'm reading reports this morning, you know, the lights and electricity and water is basically back on mostly across the country. You know, there's no doubt that this, first of all, uh, killed uh, people, including civilians, and that this, you know, was a terrifying situation for Ukrainians across the country. And it was designed to be so. But also they didn't Unlike the, you know, attack on the Crimea Bridge, which was a big psychological blow and also a big strategic blow, this didn't accomplish any sort of real battle objectives. Mm -hmm. Their hand in terms of their military tactics and where they stand has not changed because of these attacks. This is essentially like a (laughs) sort of like an anti-virtue signal, like just being able to show like we can still do something. Um, which is both designed to terrify the Ukrainian public and also to uh, sort of placate their own domestic yeah. hardliners. So they have this sort of showy display that doesn't really accomplish their battlefield objectives. And then right away, you basically have the Biden administration saying, you know those uh, anti-aircraft, anti-missile defense systems that you guys have been asking mm-hmm. for? We're going to go, and we've been dragging our feet on, we're going to go ahead and provide right. those. And that's also what complicates this so much, because on top of this, there's actually secret negotiations going on right now between the U.S. and Ukraine on whether to send F-16s and Patriot missile defense systems to Ukraine. Now, the thing is with the Patriot missile defense systems is we barely have enough in order to protect NATO and ourselves. There's a long-standing supply problem of which is very boring 
and I could go into for a long time. But the secondary part of that on the F-16s is one that has been one of those lines that the Biden administration, and NATO in particular, has been refusing to cross. Yeah. Both Poland, Romania, and others will remember the whole fighter jet controversy in yeah. the beginning of the war. Anyway, all of this is getting looped in to the current environment as to why we're spending so much time covering it because how NATO and the West decides to respond to this and the type of weapon systems they send could actually change the strategic situation overall. President Biden put out a readout of his phone call. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen with Zelensky yesterday. Here's what he said. Biden spoke today with President Zelensky of Ukraine. He expressed his condemnation of Russia's missile strikes across Ukraine, including in Kiev, and conveys his condolences. Biden pledged to continue providing Ukraine with the support, adding to defend itself, including advanced air defense systems. He also underscored his ongoing engagement with allies and partners, etc. Now, the reason why that this matters, again, is it's all being looped up. The debates on defensive and offensive weapon couched in the realm of supposedly being able to stop future Russian attacks within the context of these strikes. Now, the other problem, too, on the strikes, this is what you just said. Power is back on in Ukraine. Did it work? I mean... Kind of. Like, the Ukrainians are probably more resolute than ever. They're like, oh, wow, I really hate these people. We're not going to bow We're not going to roll I, I would feel safe. Uh, yeah. At the same time, you know, you, you know, it's like, what, you're going to bomb one of our uh, childhood parks? And it's like, we're going to, uh, parks and a pedestrian bridge where people take selfies. Right. At, like, a beautiful national place. And we're just going to capitulate to you whenever you have the unproven capabilities on the battlefield? No. The issue is that Russia also does not necessarily have a lot of these precision-guided munitions. So I looked a little bit deeper into this, and from all current estimates of their actual precision-guided munitions, there is a reason we, that we saw this limited one strike happen yesterday, and it had not happened effectively on that scale since March. It's because Russia has two things. They're not in a total war with Ukraine. If they wanted to de dedicate 100% of their military capability to this, I guess they could, and you know, frankly, right. it would be horrific for the Ukrainian people and for the world, but they also have to consider, hey, what if we get into a war with NATO? What if we get into a war with any greater power than Ukraine? We're going to need these advanced missile systems, and they do not have a lot of the production. So they have, and there's all this propaganda about the amount that's rolling off of their production line and more. But it seems that they are very limited to the conventional world, basically like weapons developed from the 1950s to like the 1970s. Like everything that's advanced and requires a lot of electronics, microchips, and more, that stuff is very difficult for them to procure at mass scale and especially at speed, which is why they have not been able to bring it to bear. Right. Anyway, so it, it bears the question of like, is this actually a real, you know, is this actually gonna be a real problem in the future? I mean, all current stocks indicate that Russia, yes, they're capable of lashing out like this, but unless they go to a total war footing, which by the way is possible, like if the Ukrainian, if the Russians, this is what we've warned about, a tactical nuclear strike, if they're regime is fully up against a the wall, then yeah, I think they might fully mobilize, dedicate their entire economy, population, and weapons cash is to war with Ukraine. But in the current environment, like I just don't see how, I don't think it would be conventionally possible for them to do so, which is, and, and, and that's not just me, like everything I've read from arms experts and more that estimate, uh, that estimate their actual force capability, in a lot of ways, the strike yesterday was a position of weakness yes. to show you, like, we can't do this all the time, but we can do it every once in a while if we well, want to. Well, and then you, it begs the question, like, what was the real purpose of yeah. these I strikes? Know. And, I, yeah. you know, I do think potentially, like, just as a reminder to Ukraine, like, we have other stuff we could do and you should continue to be terrified. But I actually think, and this is the point that um, Yegor was making to me, this is more about placating a domestic hardline audience, mm -hmm. which immediately, you know, Kadyrov and all these guys that have been out there chirping and, like— complaining about the direction of the war and, like, really raking across the coals, the military leadership. Well, they put a new, more brutal guy in charge. They unleashed these attacks on energy inf infrastructure and sort of across all of Ukraine, hitting c strategic cities across the entire country. And now those guys are all happy as they could possibly be and celebrating this great win yep. for Russia and all of this stuff. When, again, in reality, what have you done? You've burned through some of your precious stockpile. You've sort of demonstrated the limits of your capabilities. And you've 
also ultimately not change your position in terms of the outcome of the war really whatsoever. If anything, as you said, you've probably strengthened the resolve of the Ukrainian people even more to push you all of the way out. So that's why I thought, it, you know, when Yeager was making this case to me, it made sense to me that this is really more about quieting the hardliners and placating a domestic audience after this very humiliating situation with the Crimea Bridge and, you know, however that unfolded and whatever happened there, um, so that they he would sort of quiet that dissent. As we've been saying all along, the strongest adversarial voices in Russia are not those who would actually want peace. It's the hardliners. It's the people that want that that wholesale mass mobilization that want more of a hawkish approach that even in certain cases have called directly um, in Medvedev's case yeah. for tactical nuclear strikes. So that's the audience that it seems like these strikes were really designed to ultimately uh, message to. Yeah, and at the same time, the U.S. also you know, committing 100% beyond President Biden, let's put this up there, Secretary Blinken, he says, quote, I just spoke with my Ukrainian foreign minister to reiterate U.S. support for Ukraine following the Kremlin's horrific strikes this morning, we will continue to provide unwavering economic, humanitarian, and security assistance to Ukraine so can Ukraine to def defend itself and take care of its people. So, you know, basically unwavering from the United States. And I think that that is a, a pretty good overview of where things stand. Not necessarily this changed anything on the battlefield situation, but it may change things in terms of how NATO and the Western allies continue to supply Ukraine. And it does show you the dance the Russians have to walk, which is if you go too far and you actually commit to it, you could get into a broader war. If you don't go far enough, you might lose the war, which is happening right now. Anyway, critical times or lose remain on the battleground. Power, yeah. You know, and it's or, very uh, hard to have any sort of insight into whether there is a real threat of that or not. But, who knows? you know, these yeah. sorts of actions sort of indicate that he's feeling some pressure just in terms of maintaining right. his own grip on power. Yeah, I think that. I think the fact that he did it to play, and the fact that Kadyrov came out saying he now supports the military operation shows you who the intended audience for it. Beyond Ukraine, there's also many domestic audiences that he has to fulfill. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.